Polizzi. I'm founder of the Content Marketing Institute, and welcome to today's webinar entitled Teaching Your Customers to Be Publishers and Should Content Be the Center of Their Marketing, sponsored by Schweiki Today. Um, thank you so much for being involved. We are going to go through, through some uh, what I think is some very in interesting information about content marketing, and I'm going to get to that right away. Um, just to tell you a little bit about uh, what we do at the Content Marketing Institute. Basically, we try to help transform marketers into incoming publishers like yourself, focusing on less renting and more owning. And we do that through three ways. Uh, first is our events, like Content Marketing World. Second is our media properties, uh, such as Chief Content Officer Magazine. And we also do consulting for brands such as AT&T, PTC, and Tyco, which is TE Connectivity now. Um, agenda, basically, what we are going to focus focus on is the latest research on what's happening in content marketing. And then I'm going to read things you may want to be chatting with uh, your customers about, and then uh, we'll get into finally going through some questions that that I think are important as you go and back and talk to your customers. So I want to go through a couple quotes here as we start about, about the field of content marketing. And if you're not familiar with content marketing, and I'll go through it in a second, but it's basically marketers doing what you do, marketers acting. Um, like publishers and thinking like publishers. And what Pam Didner from Intel says is that we cannot accomplish our goals without compelling and relevant content for our customers. If we don't, they will not come back. If we look as Mitch Joel, and Mitch is a fantastic best-selling author, um, also founder and CEO of Twist Image, an agency, basically he said, you don't need the middleman anymore. You can now communicate directly with your customers. Your job is to create value. So to a lot of us publishers, I'm a publisher, I'm a media person, it's kind of scary to be in this business today when we think about all these marketers, how they can be publishers, how they can create um, the type of content that your readers want to get, and they might not be spending as much on advertising. Not that there's not a role for traditional advertising, but it's definitely changing, right? So there's things that we've got to do about it. And it's important that we have to realize the difference between what we do as publishers and media companies versus what marketers do. So if you really think about what is the difference between these things, it's there's actually only one thing. There really is. I mean, we are a lot alike in all ways now. You might think it's completely different, but it's not. If you think about the difference, it really is only one thing, and that's how the money comes in. If you look at publishers, media companies, we make money from selling our content directly in paid content devices or get people to sponsor our content through advertising. Those are the two ways we make our money for the most part. And it goes for events and goes for digital and, and goes for print as well. But if you look at the marketing side, how do they get money off of the content they create? They get money from basically selling more products and services because of that content creation. In essence, we are all doing the same types of things when it comes to content marketing creation. And I did take it back because I think it's important that this thing called content marketing or marketing professionals, brands themselves, non-media companies creating their own content is not new. This is actually the furrow from John Deere. This is 1931, but the furrow was a magazine that John Deere created back in 1895 targeted to farmers because farmers had lots of problems on how to deal with uh, all the new technology that was going on at the turn of the century. And they said, well, you know, what do we do to market to these people? They said, we're going to create our own marketing vehicle in the form of a magazine, very similar to what uh, what you create for your customers. And here's Vero today, over 100 years uh, into it. They're still going strong. They produce their magazine for 40 different countries. Uh, 1.5 million is the circulation. Uh, there's the magazine there and the website itself. So what we're talking about is not new at all. And actually, even though a lot of people think content marketing is a new thing, it's not. Also, Example out because I think it's really important. Jello at the you know 19 I believe it was 1904 1905. You know how do you sell Jello? How do you sell a a, um, a liquid that turns in the refrigerator when it gets cold and it's got different colors out of it? How do you really go to market with that? And actually Jello didn't pick up steam until they created a recipe book about all kinds of great recipes and some of those recipes had Jello in them. Uh, so they themselves were a publisher, and they they became famous and now a billion-dollar brand because of publishing, because they were content marketing back in 1905. And then, you know, 1906 be, became a million-dollar brand, now a billion-dollar brand. But if we look at content 
marketing equals publishing. And what is publishing, right? We're all publishers in some, you know, one way, shape, or form. But basically, publishing is the process of dissemination of information the, and the activity of making that information available for public view. So we've all been publishers. Every company in whatever business, we've always been publishers. But the difference is back then – we didn't have we didn't have this thing called mass media. We didn't have it the way we have it today. So back 100 years ago, we basically told a lot of stories to get our products and services sold, and then we went to a lot of interruption. I don't mean interruption in a negative way, but I mean that's how uh, a lot of marketers back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, when television came on, and then we went to magazines and newspapers. Basically, they we you know marketers bought a lot of advertising in your types of vehicles and publishing vehicles and media vehicles to get attention because they said oh that person has an audience and I want to sell products and services to that audience and I don't necessarily have that audience or create really good content to that audience so I'm going to you know, basically create an ad and that's how I'm going to get in front of those people that we went to interrupt type marketing and now we're going back to storytelling and why is this all back in vogue now? It's because basically content acceptance. We don't have to be the Wall Street Journal, the leading trade publication, or anybody else to get your content accepted by a reader or a consumer. If it's good, if it's designed well, people will get content in three seconds or less. And we see that from web behavior studies. They will absolutely do that. There is a large amount of talent out there. For those of you that may not know, you may be getting poached by a lot of the uh, – by a lot of the brands out there because those brands those the, the one of the number one positions being hired in non-media companies today are journalists and there are a lot of them um, i mean the, i think that the future of journalism has never been brighter but the difference is, is those journalists are getting jobs on the brand side not necessarily on the traditional media side so they are hiring because they need people that understand tell stories you, me, and the signpost, we can get a blog up and running in two seconds. There's no technology barriers. So in the past, these three barriers were definitely available, and they're not they're an issue anymore. We talk about this, this is in my first book, Get Content, Get Customers. So basically, that's what we talk about, content marketing. Uh, everything is about telling stories today. It's becoming more and more important. I'm going to get into some research in a second because I think it's really important that we talk about that. But just, you know, I just put a slide together we understand uh, what content marketing is, and that's marketing as publishers. We're owning the media channel, so your customers are owning their own channels versus renting their own channels with some of the products that you have. It means attracting and retaining customers by creating valuable and compelling content on a consistent basis to maintain or change your behavior. Very similar to what you've been doing as media companies and publishers forever. Um, the difference is that they're doing it themselves in order to sell more products and services. And really, storytelling is becoming the center of marketing programs around the country by some of the biggest brands and smallest brands around there. But but why? If you think about why it's become so important, you've got to look at this triumvirate of three things. One is search and optimization. In order to be found in Google, you have to tell really good, compelling stories. Um, in order to generate leads, so lead generation, you have to tell really good, compelling stories. It has to be great content for people to want to download that information and actually give you um, some information in order to have that be exchange of information there. And then social media. Social media have a content strategy to be successful in social, right? You're not going to connect with your customers or your, let's say your customers, uh, the brands that advertise in your magazine. Let's say they want to be successful in social. They have to be interesting first, and that's the key to making this whole thing happen. So your customers, just like you, are trying to do the same things. They want to be the magnet. They want to be the go-to source of information and through, through events, through social media, through online, whatever it takes. They want to be the magnet. So really, you look at the co competition in your industry, it is your – your sponsors are really the biggest competition that you have today as we see budgets really switch to more storytelling oriented. And, of course – even though I don't necessarily believe this because I think that traditional marketing still is very important. We do traditional marketing. Uh, we do more content marketing. But Seth Godin himself, uh, the renowned author, marketing strategist, says content marketing is the only marketing left. I just think that's kind of interesting. But the research that just came out, um, Content Marketing Institute and Marketing Profs, and we surveyed a thousand, over 1,000 uh, B2B marketers, and we asked them basically, 
realistically, who are you who are using content marketing? 90% are using content marketing right now, um, creating their own original content to attract and retain customers. So basically, every one of your customers right now is doing this in one way, shape, or form. But on content marketing, um, small companies spend about 34% of their overall budget on some type of content creation and distribution activities. Uh, larger companies spend 20%. Obviously, they have more media uh, buys, media spend. Media is usually more expensive um, than content marketing initiatives, and the average budget is 26%. So a quarter of the marketing budgets right now are going to content marketing. This kind of the, tells the tale for how your customers uh, are doing the same things that you are. Basically, look at this chart. These are the activities, the content marketing activities that your customers are engaged in right now. 80% are creating their own articles and distributing those articles in different places. 74% are creating content specifically for social media. 65% have their own blogs. Not saying they're good blogs, but they have their own blogs. 63% have e-newsletters. 56% do their own events. 52% are doing their own videos. 51% white papers. 46% webinars, and on and on and on. So basically... If you do believe that your customers are indeed publishers, this chart really tells you that, yes, they are indeed publishers, and they're doing the same types of activities that you are doing. They're just doing them for different reasons. Um, for marketers who use social media sites to distribute content, there they are, 74% Twitter, 71% LinkedIn, 70% Facebook, 56% YouTube. Um, spending over the next 12 months, 60% are increasing their spend in content marketing over the next 12 months. So it's great, you think, right? It's great for your customers because there's no barriers to entry. They're starting to spend more money, starting to tell more stories, and it's wonderful. But really, there are a lot of problems to doing this because, as you know, publishing is an art. It's not a science and an art. It's not easy, and more and more of your customers are getting into this industry, which is why I think there's an opportunity for publishers and media companies to help them and to teach them how to be publishers, but they're having a hard time at going about this. And basically, if we look at their biggest content marketing challenge across the board, and it's growing from 36% to 41%, say, producing the kind of content that engages prospects and customers is the hardest thing they have to do. It's very, very difficult. And the second one is producing enough content. So 61%, good and enough content is the hardest thing going right now in marketing departments and your customers. There is an opportunity, I think, for media companies at a, at a various uh, number of levels, and we'll get to some of those here in a second. We talk about this, Robert Rose and I talk about this in our new book, Managing Content Marketing, that for non-media companies, content marketing is new. You've been doing it forever as a media company, but it is completely new. We've got to keep that muscle in shape. It is completely new muscle, and there's a lot of things that need to be done. So what I've come up with for the rest of this webinar for the next 20 minutes, we're going to talk about eight things you may want to discuss with your customers regarding content marketing that, that I think are opportunities if you look at them on a, a number of ways, and uh, I'll make sure that I keep it shifted for media. And even though I do talk to marketers, marketing professionals most often about these opportunities, I think there really are a lot of opportunities for media companies from a couple different perspectives, and we'll talk to those. So... The one thing that you can talk to your customers about if they're interested in doing their own content, so this is new for a lot of them, or they're doing a lot of it, but maybe not as organized as you are, have them tackle one big goal, something that's broken, or maybe make something better. So if you know their marketing objectives and their goals, then you can really focus on one, one goal and that you can help them fix or make better with a content marketing initiative. Uh, the one example I like to use is Corvette Quarterly. Uh, most people think that the goal of Corvette Quarterly is a loyalty goal, the number one goal, and you know that makes perfect sense, right? You want to make sure that somebody buys a Corvette is happy. We're going to send them an ongoing magazine. But actually, the goal of Corvette Quarterly is to convert Porsche and other sports car to Corvette buyers. It's a conversion tool that can be sold to content. So this is one big idea that Cor that Corvette General Motors is trying to fix or remedy through content creation, and that's something that you can help your customers with. There's a couple other things that we can think about. If you, if you look up uh, Procter & Gamble, a lot of people don't know. I mean, Procter & Gamble is doing some amazing things with, um, with content marketing. One is their site, Homemade Simple. This is Procter & Gamble's site, and basically they focus on their different buyer personas. 
So homemade simple is targeted to let's say moms on the go, you know, they keep an organized kitchen, whatever. They have a whole content site just for uh, moms on the go. And then you'll get beinggirl.com. Not that I spend a lot of time at beinggirl.com, but beinggirl.com is for adolescent girls going through certain challenges. So that is for um, you know that's something that they have a whole content site around. This is as good as anything else out there. Uh, sponsored by Procter and Gamble. Actually, it's always in Tampax that sponsors that site. And be dudes like me, it's man of the house. Then they solve all kinds of challenges and interesting is- is- issues and situations for men. So this is kind of what you're seeing more and more brands do. And these content sites are as good as any of the ones that you'll see out there from traditional media sites. But they are backed by a brand and and brand objectives, and not necessarily uh, from media companies. Thing that you can help your, I mean, help them solve one big objective and doing it a different ways. And there's a couple of examples you saw too. The thing is, how do you help your customers reimagine content? We talk about this thing called 10 to 1. Um, we did this with our content marketing playbook, which is sponsored by Eloqua and PR Newswire. So we try to think of when you're working with a customer on one deliverable, how can you help them break that up to get the most out of that content? We think of it as 10 to 1. So you want to think before and after, like what can that content become? Because most of us, when we do custom media work, custom content work for our customers, we think, oh, we're going to deliver something like a magazine or a newsletter. But we don't often think of all the different ways they can get the most mileage out of that from a syndication standpoint. So we want to think about that three ways. One is pre-activation. What do we do before the content? What do we do to distribute the content? And how do we reimagine that content after the fact? Let me give you an idea. So when you're talking about pre-activation, Are you um, maybe notifying key customers ahead of time that the playbook's coming so that you can get additional distribution? Um, Are you looking at influencers in the industry? Uh, You're going to want to focus on that before any of the distribution goes out. Then if you think about distribution, we're talking about an e-book. Well, how are you going to distribute that e-book through, let's say, your e-newsletter or your print materials? Or how do you distribute that through Twitter or multiple times on Facebook in chunks or LinkedIn or Google Plus or StumbleUpon? or slide share, or are you going to use it for public relations, or are you going to do guest blogs around it, or are you going to promote it on your website? So you're a marketing consultant now, so you got to think about it this way, and how do you really focus on different areas there? Um, you got to think about that before you do anything. And then if you think about reimagining, think you want to take that information, and then how do you create something after the fact? Uh, when, we started, um, when I started my own blog at Junta42, I basically took that content, and six months of that content create came became a book, um, and then it became other blog posts, and it became other things after that. So how do you reimagine maybe in other eBooks? So when you have one piece of content, you can do a lot of things with it, and you need to help take your customers through that process. And also, I did want to note that Google Pan changes everything. For those of you that don't know Google Panda, Google is the update also known as the farmer update that happened in January of 2011 this year. Um, so what Panda says is that social media is more important than ever before. It's when they really started to look at social sharing and social proof. So from that standpoint, um, what you really need to think about is if your customers want their content to be found, you have to make sure that you set that up for sharing ahead of time so it can be found. It's really, really important. By doing that, then that's more important to search engines than ever before. So just something to think about there. So you, we've got to look at all the distribution tools as an option. Uh, one of my favorite is SlideShare. Most people don't use SlideShare. SlideShare is like the YouTube for PowerPoints. Love SlideShare. Uh, for this example that you're looking at here, this is a um, web content strategy presentation uh, that Christina Halverson and I did at Online Marketing Summit back in, I believe it was 2009. And since we put that up, and basically it's nothing more additional that we had to do. We just had to put it up and online, 32,000 views of that, and we've actually gotten direct business coming from this slideshow presentation. So, I mean, some things we just have to think about ahead of time that a lot of times we aren't thinking about. Customers take the visual content audit. Um, You probably already know this, but a lot of the content that your customers are creating right now is not very good, and it talks a lot about themselves, and I think that's a big, big issue. Uh, I love this because when you talk with most companies that have a blog, you look at their blog, and it's basically all about them. It's all about their products, their services, their features, and What's different publishing and marketing is is that we don't realize that our customers 
really don't care about our products and services. They care about themselves. And when we start thinking of as publishers, we're thinking about their pain points. And when I talk about the visual content audit, um, you got to think about it this way. Basically, what you want to do, you go into your client um, and have them start printing out their content, their blog content, uh, maybe their brochures, their magazines, and start putting it on the table in front of the marketing people. Have them start engaging in that content. Obviously, you want to do this ahead of time, make sure it works for you, but most of the time, that content is all about the company. And the, the whole lesson you want to get out of this is customers aren't going to share your content. They're not, they're not going to want to engage in any of this stuff because it's all about you. What we want to do is focus on what's going, what are what, keeping our customers up at night, and that's the kind of content we're going to want to make, create best in class for our, our customers, and that's what you can help them do. So just something to think about from a from a visual audit perspective. Well, I've done this a couple times, and it's been really eye-opening for clients because they don't really you don't realize it. You've got so much going on in a company, you don't realize that you're talking about yourself all the time, and maybe the content you're creating is not anything that your customers would want to engage in. The next thing you can really help your customers do is really ha help identify roles. Um, when you have a marketing team in an organization, these are the different roles. These are not position titles necessarily. They could be, but they don't have to be. But you really have to figure out what the content marketing team and those roles look at. So, for example, let's go through these. The chief content officer, that's the chief storyteller. That's the person that's responsible for setting the strategy, and that really needs to be – that has to be a role that's inside that organization. Um, these are roles you can help your customers with, but that role has to be inside. So whoever uh, the chief in the organization is, maybe that person is the chief storyteller or the chief content officer. Then you have managing editors, right? They get the work done. They're planning. They're doing all this. They're, they're taking the strategy, and they're putting it in action. Um, that role can be filled inside or outside. Then you have the content producer. Takes the content, makes it pretty. Um, you have the chief listening officer. Well, when you tell stories, especially on the web, those stories are getting interaction from somewhere. You may have to make sure that you're setting up listening posts like JetBlue at any one time. They'll have six people uh, listening on Twitter at any one time. Those are the types of things we have to uh, each company that we work with. And look, a company like Kodak actually have a position called a chief listening officer. That's kind of like the air traffic control person for that organization. And then you have content creators. Content creators could be any one of these people. They could be none of them. They could be your customers. Um, they could be um, in people in the company, product managers, uh, product, uh, and it could be engineers. Could be any. Could be the CEO. So those are all, so these are all the types of roles that you can help your companies that you work with deal with, and then some of these roles that you can help them fill and actually create revenue opportunities for yourself. The next one. Um, you can help your customers test a niche to become the leading resource for a certain area, whatever whatever it may be. Um, I like to use this one. This is from uh, Citrix GoToMeeting, um, and they do something called WorkShifting.com. If you're not familiar with WorkShifting, uh, WorkShifting is basically you can work from anywhere in the world. You can work from the airplane. You can work from the, the coffee shop. You can work from a hotel. You can work while you're walking in the park, whatever you want to do. And obviously their technology, similar to what we're on here with WebEx, is the same type of thing. Um, and they created the site, the go-to site, for answering all questions about people dealing with working on the go, working from anywhere. Um, and if you type in anything regarding work shifting around, you will come up with uh, Citrix go-to meeting, a go-to webinar. I mean, basically they dominate this. And people actually say that they are a work shifter. I, I never thought that that would happen, but they they coin this free term, and you could help your customers do the same thing, but you need really good, excellent quality content to do it. One, uh, CMO.com is a good example from Adobe. What they are focus focusing on is curating content for chief marketing officers and taking that content into digestible chunks for them. So there's another one, that you know, another example that you can use. Um, and you could actually try to convince your customers to partner with you on certain initiatives. Um, and there's, there's all different models. You can insource and outsource. I'm going to give you two examples that your customers will use. One is OpenView Labs from OpenView Venture Partners. They're uh, one of the leading uh, incubation stage, uh, stage for technology companies, but they're a VC company. 
um, they've created this site, which is an amazing site focusing on all the challenges that technology entrepreneurs have that are maybe ultimately looking for money with those their, their prospects and their customers. They've done this almost all themselves. They have their own uh, video, uh, video lab. They have their own audio studio. They have all this stuff already set up, and they created it. And they have somebody, they have a chief content officer in their organization that focuses on all this, just them. Um, so that's something that they've done all their, themselves. But if you look at American Express Open Forum, they have almost entirely outsourced all of this to um, to another group and a multiple groups, but mostly federated media that, that basically creates all the helps create all the content partners get things going um, and get that done. So you can work with your customers to actually teach them from a consulting perspective how something like oh, what OpenView is doing, or you could actually outsource that content similar to or help your customers outsource that content similar to the way American Express Forum. I think it's also important that you understand that. More and more, I mean, if you're a, a media company looking to get purchased, it's not always a media, another media company that will purchase that. I think your customers might be interested in that as well. I think this is a big, big opportunity because I think more and more of the mergers that are happening, the buyouts that are happening in media will be coming from the people with a majority of the money, and that are those are non-media companies that are actually wanting to start buying this. I mean, give me one example. I don't know if you remember, but JPG Magazine, um, from AD Publishing, when they closed their doors, they Adorama, which is a photography uh, supply company, and a group of other investors that bought JPG. I think that oh, I, I, it's really interesting to see how this plays out. But I think you're going to see more and more of this. So you can work this different ways. But I think for you personally, if you're looking to get bought out or you're looking for opportunities to partner. Uh, long term, you may actually look to look at your sponsors as a opportunity to do that. Um, the next one, help your customers reach out to content creators and influencers is very important. You could actually create a service out of this. Um, but let me give an example. So, Social Media Examiner for my friend Mike Stelzner basically started with a post a day on social media. But what he did it is he reached out to the community of social media people and all his friends, and they started to help create all this content. Basically, he set up a, an editor to edit all this content, but it was the community. So if you think about your community, those are your customers. Um, those are the consultants in your area. Those are um, the readers. I mean, anybody who's interested, he started to put together a team. And now he's a multi-million dollar property, and it's happened in 18 months, and it's really amazing to see that. He's got, as you can see, he's got 114,000 people signed up to the newsletter. He is a media powerhouse, and he's done that through just reaching out to influencers in the industry. We've tried to do the same thing at Content Marketing Institute. We have 65 um, regular contributors that contribute on the site. Well, we love these guys and gals. Um, they're from all over the place. Some of our some are our customers, some are our readers. Um, it's a little bit all over the place. An editor that edits their stuff and makes them look fantastic, and that's our regular content every day. And we're a media company too, um, but we focus most of our media resources on editing, and we get the raw content from our community, and it's really worked out real, really well. And if you think about how that can work, I think this is so important because um, if we, when we look at, I mean, here's our attraction. So here's some May to May, and now we, we get about um, 50,000 visitors a month to our site, and you can see the traction. It's been, it's been fairly impressive, and we're really happy with it. But this is kind of, I think, where to do this, but you can help your customers do it. We can't focus on, um, we want on referral traffic as much as possible, so we're not so focused on getting search traffic. So you can see these are our stats, and we get 15% of our from search engines, which if you look at media companies, most media companies get well over 25%, 30% of their traffic from search. But what we want to make sure we're not as focused on search. And by doing this whole effort of having your community involved and spreading that around, because when you get somebody from your community and writing your content, they spread that content around, and they link to it and other people link to it. And that's why we get th over 30% of our traffic from referring sites. It's very, very important um, to our strategy. As you can see, we get um, 203,000 visits from 2,000 other sources. So 2,000 sources 
on a somewhat regular basis coming to our site. That's very, very important to our overall strategy work for King. Of course, that helps us in search. can help your customers in search. can help you in search as well. So if you see that basically we've got ones in orange, those are our um, – and then the ones, the other areas that are kind of hollowed out, those are sites where we're listed first as the resources. So those, it's for, so these types of content marketing, which is our main keyword, we're found in five of the top ten. And that's the type of strategy that, that doing this and, and getting influencers to work with you and write with you, it really pays off in the long, long term. So last question for you um, is, is really to think about this, is it's very, very important. And I think it will hopefully get you to think a little bit differently about your business and working with your customers. I like to put it this way. In two years, what company will be responsible for the most content production in the world? So think about that for a second. What company do you think is best positioned or will be responsible in some way for creating the most content in the world? So just think about that, and then I'll give you the answer. There you go. I'm going to and, I'm gonna, and I think you really need to think about, from we just talked about a second ago, for focus on influencers about and get referral traffic while we don't want to be so focused on Google. Here, I don't know if you saw this recently, but Google just bought out Zagat, uh, the restaurant review company. Um, this was back in September, and they I, I'm not sure how much they purchased, millions of dollars that they purchased Zagat. And then a month later, um, they basically said they were going to commission $100 million in original content on YouTube, their sister site. Um, that's another, that's, that is original content. So if you think about it, Google is now in play and is now buying the content itself or creating the content itself. So think about how this works. Somebody goes and searches on Google. Those search on Google are Google content. People click on that content, go to Google Sites. So the more that we are dependent on Google as our revenue and our click traffic goes to our site, I think the more problems we're going to have in the future if Google continues on this path of buying out more publishers. Well, the good news is maybe they'll buy you out or maybe they'll buy me out. So there's an opportunity there, but I think that you you just got to make sure that you are not dependent on them. If you if you are not dependent on them, then it helps you either way because you get more referral traffic. You still get found in Google, but it's going to help your Google algorithms because other people are sharing your content. And, of course, that Panda update that Google just went through from an algorithm standpoint is going to help you either way. So it's something you need to think about and something that you can talk to your customers about because they need to focus on creating their own original content and getting into the right places as well so that they get found and they're not as focused on, on Google as well. Last slide I want you to think about when you are trying to help your customers be publishers. Some of you may not want to do this, by the way. Some of you say, hey, I'm not going to teach my customers how to be publishers. Well, let's figure out how to do it. Over the 10 years, we're going to see a transformation, continue to see the transformation of marketing departments becoming publishing departments. Um, there's, there's, there's no way that that's not, not going to happen. I don't know how it's going to look and what the marketing department will actually look like, but we know there's going to be more storytelling done than ever before because how do you get attention? You get attention, and that, you know this, by telling great, compelling stories and doing it in different ways where your customers are at. But regardless, you have to think about how are you going to help your customers be publishers? And you help them about figuring out what their audience really needs to know, their pain points. How do they create really good content? How do you help them share really, really often, uh, awesome stuff, the best in their industry, Focusing on the right goals for that content marketing. It's almost never about your customers, right? It's not, not about their features, the products and services. It's about the pain points of the audience. And you've been doing that for years. You can help them with that. And then what are their, what are your customers' roles? How do you help them themselves into a publishing department and really position yourself as the expert to help them do that? So I hopefully got a lot out of today's presentation. Um, if you have a lot, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me at joe at junta42.com. I'm at junta joe on Twitter. Um, we have our big content marketing event coming up September 4th through 6th in 2012 in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, it's the largest content marketing event in the world. Last year we had over 600 people from 18 countries come to the event. Uh, we really, really hope to see you there. Also, our new book, Managing Content Marketing, is out, available on Kindle and Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, and anywhere else online that you can find it. Um, but I 
again, if you have any questions on this, please, please let me know. And thank you for attending this. Uh, I think we covered some some topics I'm very passionate about. I think are very important to not only your your own strategy, but the publishing strategy of your customers. Again, thanks again, and I appreciate your time.